Good evening, welcome to the uh, Tuesday, July 7, 2020 meeting of the Rockland Board of Selectmen. Please direct your attention to Vice Chairman Larry Ryan of the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Ryan? Uh, yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which is a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Larry. Please be advised that this open meeting is being broadcast live and recorded by WRPS for playback on Comcast Channel 14 and Verizon Channel 31. It will be available for online video on-demand viewing at WRPSRockland.com within 24 hours of its conclusion, as are other recently recorded meeting and community events. Please go to WRPSRockland.com for further information. Okay, uh, first on the agenda tonight is the reorganization of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I think we'll start with the uh, chairman position and I will uh, open up to comments from the, uh, the other members of the Board of Selectmen. I'd like to make some comments. By all means. All right. Um, so we have, uh, for this past year, I, I think this board has functioned uh, very, very well. Um, we, uh, we came off um, from, from just over a year ago uh, with Larry Ryan in place during a really, um, you know, uh, a crazy time. You know, he, he brought us through um, all kinds of issues. And last year at this time, uh, we made the change and, and had Mike move into the role as, as chair and Larry and vice chair. Uh, and we didn't miss a beat. Um, and, and honestly, I think, Mike, honestly, with your, um, your organization, uh, how you are involved um, day to day in this town, uh, I, I think, um, while against what I said when I ran, that I, I didn't believe that a chairman should stay more than one year, uh, I'm going back on what I said because uh, I, I truly believe with the job that Mike has done, I, I don't think, and, and this isn't against anyone else on the board and, and including myself, I don't think there's anyone on the board who could do a better job for the town of Rockland than Michael Rockland. Thank you, Rich. And, and um, Mike Mullen, I saw that you unmuted your phone, so I'm sure you have a comment. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. At first, I was actually going to nominate Ali, actually myself, for the position. Uh, but after hearing uh, what Rich said, um, I, like, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I, you know, Mike, I mean, what I'll, I'll, you have done, the leadership you brought, I'll, you know, and follow Larry with as our chairman. I'll, you know, I'll, you know, we've all seen how you have worked hand in hand with Doug. Uh, you know, Doug Lapp, our new town administrator over the last year. Um, and, you know, I firmly believe that if, oh, you know, like if something is not broken, uh, then we don't try to fix it. And uh, like, I really do believe in our chairman right now, uh, like we have, oh, you know, someone who uh, like has demonstrated to all of us that, oh, you know, not only can you do it, you have the time to do it. Um, oh, you know, you try to really, um, encourage an environment that's very inclusive and, uh, you know, will really reflects all of our priorities and not only our priorities, but the town, uh, like in our residents, oh, uh, you know, priorities as well. So, uh, like I wholeheartedly, oh, uh, you know, oh, uh, you know, uh, support everything that Rich just mentioned. Uh, like, and if he didn't make a motion, I'd be proud to second that as well. 
right, I'll just, uh, I'll go to, uh, thank you, Mike. I'll, I'll go to Larry and Kara first, uh, just to, in case there's any other other thoughts. Uh, Mr. Ryan? Uh, Mike, you're doing a great job. And uh, we have a new administration that uh, still is uh, working toward educating themselves, um, our town and all the problems we have in it. And with our experience and leadership on the uh, uh, FinCom and, and uh, your knowledge of the town, it's, it's been a great help uh, to the covered administration and they've uh, portrayed that off to the rest of us so that we know that things are going on okay. So um, I have to agree with my uh, fellow um, select people that uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Kara? I think my colleagues have summed up nicely once again, but I couldn't agree more with them on this issue. Mike, you've been a friend and a mentor uh, to all of us, especially towards me over my first term on the Board of Selectmen. I don't think anyone can do a better job right now than you as chairman and lead us through the next year. Okay, so thank you guys. Uh, so with that, I, I entertain a motion. Yeah, so I, I didn't make a motion uh, after my first comment because I wanted to make sure everyone had um, mm -hmm. an opportunity to speak. So I would like to be the one that makes the motion uh, to uh, appoint Michael Laughlin as uh, chairman of the Board of Selectmen for the next year. Yeah, yes, and I'll second that. Oh, up that. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Uh, so all those in favor, Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Mullen? Yes. Mr. Penny? Yes. And Ms. Nyman? Yes. Thank you, guys. I, uh, I, I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's been, it's uh, been an uh, interesting year, to say the least. Uh, it seems every time you know, we think we're coming out of something, something, something even bigger comes along. And uh, you know, I, I think as, as a team, we've, we've done a decent job of, of communicating and supporting Doug uh, and his team, which is, I think is the most crucial thing that we do, uh, just helping them and giving them the space to do their jobs. So uh, with that, uh, Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman. Yeah, this is uh, Vice Chairman Ryan and I am going to uh, step down and uh, I'm going to nominate Kara Nyman to uh, take over my spot as Vice Chairman. I think she uh, is ready to uh, get involved with the town and uh, more deeply and learn the inner, inner workings of what we do here on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, that would be my nomination. Anybody else? Larry, I, I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, I, I think um, looking at this board, um, you know, uh, I think it is time for that younger um, generation to have that opportunity to step up. Um, nothing against me and you, Larry, but we're we're on the uh, we're on the downside, um, and uh, I do think uh, this is a, a perfect opportunity uh, to allow Kara uh, to step into this role and and take more of a leadership position within the town. So, I would second that nomination. Mr. Mullen, any any thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, again, I was hoping someone would nominate, I'll ask you me, uh, but, oh, you know, oh, you know, not having that been the case, um, I wholeheartedly support everything that Rich, Alec, and Larry have mentioned. And, oh, you know, I, like, I would be extremely proud, oh, you know, to have, oh, you know, with Kara and you leading us forward. So, Alec, I wholeheartedly support that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I, I agree. I agree with what everybody else said. You know, Kara, you've uh, you've certainly stepped up uh, in the year and a half or eighteen months you've been on the board. Uh, it hasn't been easy, and it's been trial by fire. Uh, you know, like I said, it, it's been a really crazy you know year and a half. And uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing you grow in the role as vice chairman. And and my hope is to continue to work with you and, and have you possibly in the seat at, uh, next year this time. So I'll entertain, so I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Penny? Yes. Mr. Mullen? Yes. And myself is a yes. Carrie, will you accept it? I will. Okay, excellent. Great. Okay, cool. moving on. Uh, community announcements, healthcare worker of the week. Mr. Lapp. 
Thank you, everyone. Um, pleased to announce uh, the latest healthcare worker of the week. I'm going to read her statement. Uh, her name is Betsy Wiley. She said, I've lived in Rockland for the last 18 years. I've worked in an inpatient cardiac care unit at Boston Medical Center as a staff nurse for the past 20 years. I also work part-time at VinFen, caring for developmentally delayed adults in a rehabilitation setting for 12 years. I earned my bachelor's of, bachelor's of science in nursing from Northeastern University. This community has been amazingly supportive to me and my family while I took care of COVID-19 patients. I love being a nurse. Thank you to the town of Rockland. This is why I, I love living here and the people who live in it. So I wanna thank her and congratulate her and uh, we appreciate everything that she's doing. That's the only announcement that I have tonight. Okay, excellent. Um, bear with me one second, my agenda closed. Okay, open session minutes uh, for June 16, 2020. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I got a motion, do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, Mr. Ryan? Oh, actually, Ms. Nyman. Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Mullen? Yes. And Mr. Penny? Yes. And myself. Okay. Uh, that's approved. Next on the agenda, new business. Uh, school committee vacancy appointment uh, per MGL Chapter 41, Section 11. Uh, so this came up uh, about a month, month and a half back uh, when Mr. Phelps, uh, you know, resigned from the board uh, for, you know, health reasons. Uh, so what happens is, is we post it and between, you know, ourselves, uh, the board of selectmen and the school committee, uh, we, we vote on the position, uh, who would take that, that position until the next election comes up. So this position, if I understand correct, would run from now until uh, our April election, and then there would be uh, an election for the, the rest of Mr. Phelps's term, which I believe would be one year at that point. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, school committee chairperson, uh, Joe Maroney. Joe? Thank you, Chairman Olofen. I just wanna confirm with Dr. Cron about that. Timeline. I was gonna say, um, Mr. O'Loughlin, I'm not sure about that. I thought that, that um, Mr. Biggins would finish up the term that Mr. Phelps had earned. That was so, my understanding. So we can confirm that with, with counsel. Yeah, we, we double check some stuff on the I charter. Believe, I believe that's the case and there's nothing in the charter about it. Uh, I, thought, I read it today. So we talked to a couple people on, on the charter and they had said that it, the appointment would be made. It might be different with school committee. I think it was for us, it was till the next election uh, is available. Uh, so in the case of when we, uh, you know, appointed, you know, a couple people before, or rather when they, you know, won the, the election, it was just until the next election was available and then, but we can double check that. So e either way, it's for, yeah. for Dick's campaign, you know, Dick's seat until, you know, we figure out if it's, April or if it's further than that, but we can get clarification yeah. on that. But that won't change what, what any, any kind of discussion or uh, movement forward for tonight, so. Okay, so thank you. I just wanted to be clear before we move forward that we all understood that we're not sure. Um, thank you again. I want to just say thank you to um, the two that put themselves in for appointment, Mr. Biggins and um, Mrs. Forrester. Um, these are big shoes to fill. Mr. Phelps was huge for here, for us here on the school committee and in Rockland itself. Um, and like we've said, this year has been a topsy-turvy year. Um, so to put yourself up into this and volunteering for this um, is big to me and I appreciate them um, trying to jump in. And um, so that's kind of all I have to say. Thank you for jumping in. I'll pass it back to you, Mr. O'Loughlin. Okay, so I'll, I'll open it up to uh, to anybody that has has any any discussion about the two candidates. Do we have the two candidates available? I'm here, Mr. Ryan. Okay, we have Dan, and who else we got? There's the other young lady also. It's Mrs. Forrester, and I don't believe that she is here. Yes. Should we hear from them? Well, I, I don't believe she's here with us, Larry. Oh, okay. Um, firstly, uh, you know, Dan has already 
been on the board. He's familiar with the with the players involved <clears throat> and the current status of, of the school's issues. Um, the other woman I, I haven't heard of for a while, and and uh, she's probably very capable also. So, um, is it the guy that's been in the fray, or do we for uh, for a different look at it? Um, I would tend myself to go with Mr. Biggins only because of his experience, his current experience, and his uh, still his relationship with the uh, school committee people and the uh, principal and the and the superintendents of the schools themselves. So um, either either one would probably be a good candidate, but I think Mr. Biggins has the most experience uh, to help us deal uh, immediately with uh, all the current that are presented to us in the town. Thank you, Larry. Any, any other comments about either of the candidates? Well, if I could, Mr. Chair, um, and I agree wholeheartedly with Larry. I think where, uh, you know, Dan has been with the school committee, um, his understanding of the issues about where we are um, and how he could work with, uh, you know, uh, the current school committee, uh, the school administration, like in the town, oh, uh, you know, to help, oh, uh, you know, oh, uh, really continue to move the ball forward. Um, uh, like I think is really an asset. Um, at this point, and oh, uh, you know, um, uh, like oh, uh, and especially in terms of understanding the, oh, uh, you know, the partnership and the dynamics between the town and schools. Oh, uh, you know, oh, uh, you know, based on the issues that, oh, uh, you know, had. Uh, that Dan had been involved in previously, there's no better person, uh, 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 really in my mind, who understands all that. So uh, I wholeheartedly agree, Mr. Ryan. Okay, uh, anybody else? Any further discussion on the matter? Yeah, I just- Go ahead, Rich? go ahead. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, I wanna thank both of them, uh, both Mr. Biggins uh, and Ms. Forrester for stepping up. Um, as it was mentioned, um, fill in the shoes of, you know, virtually a town legend in Dick Phelps uh, is, is not an easy task. Um, I do think, uh, fortunately, I, I know both individuals, uh, one of which I literally have known my entire life. And I think both of them um, are, are volunteering to step up for the right reasons. Uh, that they, they care about the town, they care about the children in the town, and I don't think we could go wrong in, in either selection, uh, but to Larry and, and Mike's point, um, Dan has, um, he, is, he has the experience, he, he has shown in the past uh, what he has done uh, for, the, um, for the school system. Uh, so I, I would have no problem at all um, uh, with, with Dan in that position, uh, but I did wanna say thank you to uh, to Ms. Forrester uh, for, uh, for volunteering and uh, willing to step up. Okay, any, any further comments before we, uh, before I call for a motion? Mr. Chairman? Yep. Uh, can I make a few comments? Absolutely. I also want to thank Mrs. Forrester for stepping up and, you know, applying to be appointed to this position. As a board, um, I think we're always encouraging new people and new faces to, you know, step up and be involved on committees in town. So I want to thank her for coming forward. But I also have to agree with the board on this. Um, Dan has been a great asset to the school committee over the years and to our community, and I wholeheartedly support him for this position. Okay, so we've heard from the selectmen. Any comments from any of the members of the school committee on the issue, seeing as it will be a committee member of, of yours? I would, but if someone else, Emily or Jamie? Yeah, I would just like to thank Dan. Um, I think going with him and him coming back into the school committee is a great option. Um, he has the experience. He has the voice of reason that a lot of people in town listen to and look up to, um, especially with the school. Um, kind of in an unknown of going back in the fall, just with COVID, I think um, all together, the five of us are gonna work very well together and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Joe? 
I would have to agree with Emily. I think she said exactly what I was feeling as well, that um, I think the five of us will work really well together. I don't want to discourage Ms. Mrs. Forrester for um, chiming in maybe at a later time, but I really do think that right now, um, the schools, the town, the students, the faculty all sort of need what we know. Um, we need to roll together. We have a lot on our plates and um, we want this to be sort of seamless and we don't really have time to figure things out. Um, we are sort of in the world of unknown and um, Dan has that knowledge and the ability to be able to work with us and keep us going and like you said, moving forward. So I appreciate Arista for stepping up, um, but I also appreciate Dan for coming back and jumping back in. I'm sure it wasn't easy. It's not an easy job every day um, and it is every day, um, but we are here um, to do what we do and because we love the kids in this town. So thank you both. That's all I have. Okay, any other comments? Okay, with that said, I'll entertain a motion. Um, Mr. Mills is just here. I'm sorry to cut you off. Mike, I just wanted to give him a minute. Do you want to chime in, Mr. Mills? No, I, I have, I, I, I just, I don't know what you're talking about. So, okay. <laughs> it's going on. Sorry to put you on the spot. Did you have any yeah. comment to Mr. Riggins or Mrs. Forrester coming on to the board with us? Uh, uh, no, that would be fine. Okay. Yeah, before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Then I will make a motion to have Mr. Riggins fill the spot for Mr. Phelps to be appointed for us on the school committee. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Hennessy? Yes. Okay, Ms. Davidson? Yes. Mr. Mills? Yes. Ms. Maroney? Yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Penny? Yes. Mr. Mullen? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. And myself is a yes as well. Dan, welcome back to the board. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, and just quick comment, I just want to um, stress that I, I can't uh, underestimate how big these shoes really are to fill. Um, Mr. Phelps is someone, as you all know, that I admire very much and um, his impact on this committee and these, these kids in our town and uh, uh, school uh, faculty and staff is undoubted and undisputed, just an amazing guy. and. The schools are going to miss him. Um, the, I will miss him on uh, working with him on this committee. Um, but I know he's still around and around town. We'll be, I know we can all look forward to seeing our, our, our friend, Mr. Phelps, around. But I am very much looking forward to finishing out um, his term, whatever is left of it, whatever is appropriate, whether it be a year or more, or whatever it is you guys need of me, I'm happy to help for it. Um, and just looking to be a part of the solutions to the many challenges that we have going forward as a school community. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Welcome back. Thank you. Just when you thought you were out, right? <laughs> well, I'd never get out. Just uh, <laughs> never. <laughs> was, uh, always here to help. Always here to help. But um, in this role, I thought it sort of had concluded. But um, sometimes life throws a curveball and you just got to hit it. So looking forward to getting back to work with you all. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so moving on. So uh, the school committee, I mean, you guys are welcome to stay. I'm, I'm not sure if you guys, if you are needing to adjourn your meeting. No, no, we need no, to adjourn it. They don't need to. Okay. Uh, make a motion to adjourn the uh, school committee meeting. Second that. Joe, you want to take call. What? You can call all those in favor. It's, it's your group. <laughs> all those yeah. in favor? <laughs> I, uh, Tom Mill says yes. Tom uh, Mill says yes. Jamie and Emily are both putting their hands up as yes. yes. Sorry, Mike. I liked yes. you talking. <laughs> Not. <laughs> it was right, good. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Can you. Be well. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals vacancy, uh, alternate to permanent member appointment, uh, five-year term for uh, Robert Baker. Uh, any? Um, may I? Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. Um, Against uh, appointing Mr. Baker to a five-year term, 
Um, <clears throat> I just don't think he fits the bill right now for what we need as a town. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any comments? Yeah, yeah. I just have a quick question. I mean, in terms of advertising, oh, you know, the, oh, what I assume is a vacant, is a vacant, oh, regular member, a regular member position. Oh, you know, well, should we first try to advertise it or um, is there something different about this? Uh, like where we have a timers of the essence issue? Well, you know, I don't think we have a timers of the essence issue. I, I think it's one of those things that, uh, that there's an opening for a permanent member. But my, my bigger concern is that there are, I think Mr. Baker is the last of the alternates. So it, it pretty much defaults to him. So I don't think, I don't think there's any rush to fill the seat. He can vote as an alternate uh, until we get more alternates and, and maybe deepen that pool to pick from, to assign somebody for a five-year position. Um, I mean, Tom, Tom, you, you work, uh, Mr. Rubel, you work with the, the zoning board uh, more than the rest of us. Uh, Mr. Baker is currently the only alternate on the board, right? You're muted, Tom. That's right. Okay, so, you know, I mean, we, we'd pretty much be handing over uh, a position uh, by default. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe, uh, Mike, if, if I hear what you're saying is, uh, I guess maybe table it until we appoint, we advertise that we're looking for, for other members on, on the board, uh, fill some of the alternate positions, and then, then come back with it and take a look at, at who is uh, looking to apply for that permanent position. Mike, I agree. So, you know, not that long ago, we had a, a similar scenario with the, uh, with the zoning board. Um, and we, I think we did a very good job of, of posting it, getting the information out. If I remember right, we ended up probably with about five or six candidates. And, and I'm going to be honest, um, what we were able to put on the zoning board um, was, was a pretty high level uh, you know, Few people that went on there. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of people in town with skill sets to do this. I just think at time, at times, people are either unaware uh, or we don't do a good job of getting that information out to the right people. Um, so I would, you know, I, I would look to to do this, post it, um, try to make it as public as possible talk it up on the, on the uh, Board of Selectmen meetings, get it out there, get it out on social media, and let's see um, what we can get for some, some candidates. Uh, so it isn't, you know, nothing against Bobby Baker, but so it's not just a default because no one else applied for it. Yeah, and, and I think to, to that point, is, there's, as an alternate, you know, being that there's an empty spot, it wouldn't stop anything from any votes from happening because he would just be a voting member at that point as an alternate. So, you know, I, I think we've been really hesitant to, to have our hands forced. I, I think, you know, we've kind of looked at that and, and, and said, you know, nobody gets a position by default. Right. And, and to your point, nothing against Bob Baker at all, nothing at all. But when somebody's presented to us as the only option, you know, it, it's, I, I think I'd like to see if, there's other candidates, anybody that wants to get onto the zoning board as an alternate. And then I think we're allowed to, what, have three alternates, Tom? Mr. Rubel, three alternates on the zoning? What was that? How many alternates are you allowed on the zoning? I this believe there's this is two. But there's two because we lost a couple of members that are already I think, you're allowed, I think you're allowed up to, what, three alternates total? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So I, I think we look to fill those positions and then, and then take a look and, and uh, you know, get touch base with the zoning chair and, and go from there. So um, from, I, I guess what I'm hearing is. Make a motion that we put it off till the September, uh, first meeting in September and advertise between now and then because there is no uh, big hurry. We have a full board that can function with the, with the four members in the, in the alternate. So I'd like yeah, to thank I'd second that. All right, I have a motion and a second. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Mullen? Yes, sorry. And Mr. Penn? Yes. 
and myself. All right, so so that's a vote to table the appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, until first meeting in September. Uh, Doug, you good with that? Advertising ad advertising the position. I think I think there's a need for for two positions because I, I don't think we have any more alternates. So it'd actually be a need for three positions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them would be going to the permanent member and, and three alternates. So. Yeah, that, that's totally fine. I'll work with the chairman of the ZBA and make sure we have the number correctly and we'll do some extensive advertising. Sounds great. Thank you, Doug. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, FY20 year-end transfers. Mr. Lapp. You know what, I'm just gonna hand this one right off to our town accountant and uh, Biz can take care of this one. Sounds great. Okay, good evening. Um, each year between May 15th and July 15th, the communities are allowed to do year-end transfers to balance individual line budgets. At this time, we have very few that we have to do. I'm requesting roughly $155,000 based on estimated deficits in various departments. Um, you all have a copy of this. If you'd like me to go over the departments, I will. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to blanket it at 155000 of which we'll be taking the money and fulfilling those deficits with other budgeted items. What's unusual this year is the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen will not be meeting again until August. So I am also requesting that the town accountant uh, is requesting permission to complete additional year-end transfers as necessary up to the date of July 15, 2020, in accordance with MDL 4433B, transfer of appropriations year and transfers. The town account will provide the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee of any additional transfers at the scheduled August meetings. Um, currently, I might have three or four more to do, but they'll be transferred within the budgets. We don't need outside revenue to cover any deficits. And we're just now finishing our last June 30 um, accounts payable report. So once that's complete, once we get into August, as I'm closing the books, I can give you an update. So I'm kind of requesting a little bit of leeway here from you, but I've also informed you of what we're looking at right now. Any questions? Nope. Any questions from the board? None here. Yeah, no, None I don't here. have any either. That all makes perfect sense. Thank you, Biz, for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Biz. Thank you. Um, okay. And on that, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the uh, $155,000 in transfers. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Mullen? Yes. And Mr. Penny? Yes. And myself? Okay. The second Thank part you. of that, Mr. Chairman, oh, would I'm be sorry. to, yeah. that's okay, would be to vote the town accountant's request to continue yeah. year-end transfers. That's part yeah. two. So moved. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you guys are you guys are all all over these motions tonight. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is crazy. All right, I got a motion in a second. <laughs> Miss Nyman. Yes. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Mr. Mullen. Yes. And Mr. Penny. Yes. All right. Thanks. This is unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, Biz. All right, moving on. Uh, McKinley School Community Center Feasibility Study Studio MLA Architects Doug. Thanks, Mike. So with us tonight, we have Liz Hall and Mike Lindstrom from Studio MLA Architects. And I'm going to ask Liz if she can share her screen and pull up a PowerPoint presentation uh, to share. And I think once she gets that up, I think I'm going to actually kick it off with one of the first slides. Um, and then uh, others will be doing the rest. And I think I'll close it out on the last slide. So if we go on to the first slide or the second slide. So I thought it would just be helpful to give a little bit of a background about this project. So um, as a reminder, this, this feasibility study uh, and facility assessment of the McKinley School was funded a little over a year ago at last year's annual town meeting. Uh, and that was funded with a $30,000 appropriation. Um, we put together a, a team of, uh, in addition to the architects, which I'll talk about in a moment, we have a, a town staff group that includes myself, the assistant town administrator, Jan Constable, a youth commission director, Jean Blaney, youth commission chairman, Rich Furlong, our building inspector, Tom Rubel, 
and our school department facilities director, Mark Sham. And I think everybody's with us tonight on the Zoom meeting, except for Mark, who wasn't able to join us. But I want to thank all the staff that um, helped with this because it was a really good team effort and everybody kind of came at it from their own angle with their own insights and, and um, pieces of knowledge that I think helped the architects frame a really good, a really good study. The, the other thing I wanted to highlight about this firm, Studio MLA, is they're really excellent. They're highly qualified and we, we selected them through the competitive request for qualifications process, which is part of the state's designer selections law. So we, we followed that process. And as part of it, uh, we did include language that if the town ultimately decides to actually fund this project, we can continue with Studio MLA without having to do a whole nother RFQ again. Um, but you'll see as they go through this uh, presentation that they're very experienced and very knowledgeable, and I, I think you'll get a lot out of it. So with that, I'll, I think Jean Blaney is going to do the next slide um, before we go into the others. Thanks, Doug. Um, so as most everybody knows on this board that we host um, several different programs in the community center. Um, first being the Rockland Youth Commission. We've then been there for, actually, I don't even know how long because Karen was there before me, but I've been there for six years um, in this space and it is definitely a great space to have. Um, and I feel very lucky um, to have it. We also have Rockland Daycare. Um, they are a very large part of this building. Um, they take up two floors um, or really one and a half. And, um, and then we also have the Historical Commission. They have a room on the third or they had a room on the third floor. Um, and then the um, other programs that we have is self-help. Um, so self-help offers free programming from for children, infants to six years or just entering kindergarten. Um, we have a lot of folks that can't afford our preschool programs and um, rely on self-help for development of their children. Um, we have the WIC program. Um, WIC is, I want to say it's a state funded program. I'm not 100% positive on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. And um, they're a big part of our, they're, they're in our building every Wednesday and um, it is a flow of traffic from the young women and um, men in Rockland that need their services. So they provide <clears throat> subsidy, sub, subsidy servants, sub, I can't even talk, I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's been a very long day. <laughs> Subsidized services such as um, they give them um, formula diapers, and then point kind of give them direction on where to find other subsidy programs. Um, the Girl Scouts meet. Wow, I think we have five Girl Scout groups that actually meet at our facility. Um, and we do, I think we do a really good job of managing them and rotating them through the building. Um, they utilize it for not only their meetings, but their functions. Um, Boy Scouts actually meet probably once a month. We have um, a couple of troops that come and use our facility, mostly the gym and the community um, community room. And then we have other communities, other, other people within the community that uh, meet at our building on sometimes a regular basis, sometimes it's just once a month. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have a pretty good impact on our community. Um, I neglected to say for the Youth Commission, we have all of our youth and sports programs as well as our taught enrichment program, which is our pre preschool program that we've been running. I think I wanna say it's been since the 70s. Um, in addition to that, our teen center program, which everybody knows and loves um, and has grown over the past couple of years. They actually are in the gym and in part of the basement area. I think that about does it. Thanks, Jean. Um, hi everybody, my name is Liz Hall. I'm an architectural designer at Studio MLA. Also on this call is our principal, Mike Lindstrom, and I believe our landscape director is also on the line, Joanne Hiramura. Um, I'm just gonna get right into it. If you hear any strange noises like fireworks <laughs> or the road, that is because I'm on a main drag. <laughs> so, our mission to improve in gen like big picture. Um, the quality, obviously the quality and of the interior and exterior spaces, meaning 
updating everything from finishes to systems to the facade. Um, and then by doing that and changing um, the floor plans a little bit, and by doing that, we would improve the quality and the quantity possibly of the programs served. So there's a lot of inefficient spaces. Um, there's a lot of storage that we could probably move around and, and gain some extra space and um, really improve the quality for the, for the patrons. Then another big one is the accessibility and the safety of the building. So, you know, for example, right now, the elevator malfunctions, it's too small. Um, we've got some accessibility, but not all spaces are accessible, um, meaning uh, handicapped accessible. Um, and some exterior spaces, um, pedestrian travel are a little confusing, that, so that could improve the safety of the building. Um, then the building itself is on the National Historical Register, so we would want to maintain that. It's just starting to, to fall um, into some need of repair, and uh, it would be good to upgrade those to maintain that landmark. And then as I understand it, there's a big um, revival on Union Street. And I think both the visual of the building and then the proposed exterior improvements um, would be a catalyst in that revival um, to really improve the, the streetscape and the view from the street. I just jump in for a second, Liz, and say that I think we found really a remarkable community. Um, all of the You're breaking up a little. I think a lot of the, the challenges, there's a lot of work to do here. So I think, you know, that's the bigger. Um, I think the, the whole Rockland team has been really great to work with and they, they've taken a really common sense, you know, attitude toward this, but as was an approach that would really, really fix everything, right? So that's So oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in, Mike. Just so you know, you're breaking up a little bit, but I I think um, you may have gotten the gist. Your the pros definitely outweigh the cons, but we want to upgrade to make it all pro. Um, so here's the timeline. Um, we started by doing a um, an, an analysis of what was there. We visited the site. We spoke with the team that you've heard about before, um, and did a phase one report that sort of documented how the building is now and you know room areas that we saw room for improvement on then phase two we took that information and documented the spaces that you currently have in the building and created um and so that's what when i say programming in the, this list right here that's what that is a list of spaces and so then we created three new programs with the help of the team for the ideal for the ideal concept um, options. And then with those spaces, meaning square footages and stuff, we went forward and made three floor plan options for each floor. Um, and for the landscape, we did two options. Um, and then with those, we could get preliminary pricing. So then that could inform us when we went on to phase three, which you'll see is a, a little longer than originally uh, anticipated for reasons I'm sure we're all familiar with um, and finalize that into a, a cohesive design that we felt would be most beneficial and then get some final pricing on that and we did some um, renderings of the spaces which I'll show at the towards the end. So I'm going to go through all of that um, briefly each phase. So Phase one, building evaluation, the exterior. So the front yard, and I will, I, there are pictures after this slide, um, but the front yard is sort of, you know, unattractive. And as I was saying before, it would really help to upgrade it from the perspective of Union Street um, and really be more inviting to patrons. And then the playgrounds need some improvement um, for, you know, just, if you, if you drive by, you can see there's some sort of donated furniture and and um, playground equipment, it would be, be good to upgrade those and then also upgrade those so that we could achieve, achieve higher certification for the daycare. Um, the back lot, the back parking lot, 
um, is sort of, it's striped a little, but it's not striped efficiently and has um, some spatial inefficiencies that, that we, wanted, we wanna take back and reorganize um, into a better area for the staff and patrons. Then the exterior walls and everything on the outside, there's a lot of damage and I'll go through some pictures and show you um, uh, in the masonry, in the wood, um, soffits and everything out there. There's um, the cast stone along the base of the building and the columns is all broken away and needs to be repaired. Um, and those all things that I just mentioned are historically significant. So it's definitely a high priority thing to um, repair. So here's a picture of the front yard and I hope that you all can see my mouse. Um, don't mind when the mouse hovers over it. It comes up with an automatically generated caption for some reason. So along, you can see all of the disrepair on the wood. And when we get a little closer, you can see it on the brick. But you can see even from this viewpoint, you can see the damage on the um, cast stone along the foundation. It's a picture that I was mentioning before of the playground equipment. Um, and on the right, again, you can see the cast stone damaged um, with safety barricades in front of it, not only for that, but for snow, um, we'll get into it a little later, but the, the roof, you know, the snow rail, some of it is damaged and some of the slate pieces are damaged and need to be replaced. And so um, we've got some barricades out there for safety purposes. Um, again, more damage along the roof line. You can see damage on the exterior walls, above doors. Um, the steel in the in the window lintels is starting to rust in, in almost all of them. And some of them it's extreme to the point where it's damaging the, the brick along. So the lintel is, is above here and below. Um, and so it starts to push the brick out when it starts to rust. Um, and then on the back area where the gym is, you'll see that some of the truck is going by. Um, you'll see that some of the um, panels on the on the paneled addition are falling off and so we're re recommending that those be checked and see you know which other ones are loose and need to be repaired. And those that was not a comprehensive list I'll just say that we have an entire report that has the comprehensive list of things that need to be repaired. Um, just wanted to highlight major things. So in the interior um, at worst, the finishes are worn and, and old, outdated at, or at best, sorry, and at worst, they are damaged and, and need to be replaced. So meaning the paint, the flooring, the ceiling, the lights, um, the doors. Um, and as I mentioned before, the space isn't really used efficiency um, and it creates a lot of redundancy and uh, wasted space. Um, and as I mentioned before, not all spaces are accessible with the elevator um, malfunctioning and not being correctly sized for accessibility. And um, on the second and third floor, um, half of the floor plate is raised up about 21 inches. And there's a ramp on the second floor, which is not a, an accessible ramp. And then on the third floor, there are no ramps. It's just stairs up to those areas, um, which would not be uh, acceptable accessibility wise for the public. Oops. And then I've mentioned all the rest of this, the elevator, the me mechanical and electrical uh, equipment and plumbing have all really reached their useful lifespan is, is how the engineers put it. Um, and the mechanical needs to be fully replaced. The plumbing, there are certain things that need to be um, replaced and, and same with electrical. There's a lot a lot of systems work that needs to happen before um, the pretty finishes can can really do their work properly. And then um, along those lines, the sprinkler system right now, I believe, I believe Doug, it, it got, it's officially a go, but right now basement through the second floor are sprinklered and there's a project intended already in the works to get the third floor sprinkled. So here's some just pictures of the interior. This is the teen center downstairs. It it functions, but it's it sort of feels like you're in a space that you're you're making 
use of, you know, it's not really for them. It feels a little alien. Um, they've done a really great job of creating posters and, and making it feel homey, but I feel like we could do a lot better for them. Then the gym is um, the flooring really needs to be replaced and the lighting and the walls you know, if you painted them, it'd be one thing, but really repairing them and painting them would be best. Um, and here's some pictures of the inefficiencies, inefficiencies that I've been talking about. Um, there used to be a kitchen down here when it was school and it's not used anymore, but it's just sort of got all this extra equipment and this big HVAC exhaust unit and, and just kind of is used for storage and, and isn't used efficiently. Same with um, some decommissioned bathrooms in the basement. Um, and they're being used for storage right now with the toilets and everything still there. Um, and I wanted to get some pictures of the systems that need to be replacing. Um, for example, you know, all this exposed piping typically by code needs to be insulated and is not currently. Um, and obviously, general, you can see that things are in disrepair on the walls and everything. This is in the basement. Then the classrooms on the second floor and third floor, um, third floor is empty, but everything just, you can see the flooring really needs to be replaced. The, the ceiling is very sort of dirty and the lights are old and um, the daycares themselves need to be upgraded. Um, if they're going to um, go for a certain licensing, EEC licensing, um, with things like food preps and changing stations. Um, we'll get into that. Then there are certain areas like this picture where there's a lot of water damage above the ceiling causing mold, um, which is, I don't need to tell you, it's bad. So the general layout, I won't, you know, point every, every, every room, but the basement is where the teen center is and the gym where my pointer is. And then there's like a lot of storage and systems around this sort of perimeter area. And um, WIC space was down here. Uh, then the first floor where you enter, where my mouse is, is where you enter the building with the big stair. Um, that's where the uh, administrative areas are um, to the left and right when you walk in and to the back of where you, where you walk in are the two community rooms that are separated by a movable partition. And then this room in the corner is a, a multi-purpose room used for the self-help uh, program and the bottom two rooms are daycare. Second floor is all daycare um, with a sort of a, a room to spare um, that we utilize in the future plans. And then like I said, the third floor is abandoned but um, Historical Commission uses it for storage and meetings sometimes. So phase two, that was a lot. Um, phase two is when we generated three options. So these were hypothetical options and I'm gonna go through them rel relatively quickly because phase three is where we bring it all together and, and decide you know, what's best. So option one option or the dreaming option um, where we completely reconfigured the basement. We kept the teen center down there, but we found a lot of space where we could, like that abandoned kitchen, where we could expand and create recreational facilities for young adults. One of the things that we identified as a group was something in Rockland that could be used is recreation facilities, meaning like a gym situation. Um, and those abandoned bathrooms would serve really well as locker rooms and bathrooms. It's already got the you know plumbing sort of set up and could be expanded into um, bigger, more useful things. Um, and one of the highlights of this area is where my mouse is now would be a new cafe that could be shared by the teen center and the rec center. And you would be able to enter, not in the main entrance, but on the side entrance where a lot of people enter through to get to the gym. Um, you'd enter through this cafe area and that would be how you would access the teen center primarily. Um, and the recreation area. So you wouldn't have to wander through the building to get to these sort of public zones. Um, then also on the, on the basement level, we considered and we got pricing for replacing and the gym entirely, because right now it is not a, um, a regulation sized gym. It's for uh, elementary school sized basketball and could be, um, we got pricing for a new addition. Um, 
The first floor, we totally reconfigured and almost all of these options, actually all of the options, reconfigured the admin areas, the administrative areas where the youth commission and the daycare ad, um, admin are kind of smushed right now and, and the, the, it's a technical term. Um, and we thought if we reorganized it, added a couple accessible bathrooms and created a security checkpoint that would be ideal for both daycare and youth commission. Um, and then reconfigure the um, community rooms to be bigger and um, give them a new partition, a new sliding partition. Um, then on the second floor, we sort of right sized the daycare classroom. So they're a little awkward right now. It could be expanded to be, you know, ideal sized and gave them all their own restrooms, which is what we would typically do if we were designing something from scratch. Um, they would sh could share between two classrooms, but right now they all sort of march out in a line and get in a line for the, the single boys and girls bathrooms. Um, and it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay, but it's not ideal. Um, then the third floor, we took advantage of the change in level that I spoke about before. So on the second floor, I'll just mention that we replaced the ramp so that those classrooms that were, are raised up 21 inches now have an accessible ramp to them. And then on the third floor, we did something similar, but we took it a little further and took that raised area in the, in the west portion of the floor plate and turned it into a, a sort of a stage um, to have an auditorium, maybe for public meetings, for community theaters, for community dance, um, anything like that, sort of small size, that's not a hearing room, but not, you know, a high school gymnasium. Um, and utilize the two wing areas for town hall hearing rooms, additional hearing rooms and um, multi-purpose rooms. So the second option was a little less dramatic, a lot less dramatic, um, where we just sort of reconfigured the basement a little bit by, we basically tried to use spaces on the basement and second floor as they were. We configured a little bit on the first floor, similar to what we did on the previous option. Then the second floor, we just sort of used that abandoned classroom that I talked about to create a um, STEM art room. And which really is just adding a sink and some finishes that make it easier for like sloppy artwork, you know, um, and cleanup. Then on the, and we added the ramp that's needed on the second floor. And then on the third floor, um, we added two hearing rooms and multi-purpose rooms um, just to sort of expand on town halls here in capabilities. Then speaking of town hall, the third option was a very hypothetical option where in some future world, the daycare left this building um, and the town hall offices moved in. We wanted to see if that would work. And the short answer is yes. Um, and so in the basement, we kept that being the teen center and the cafe, like in the first option um, and reconfigured the first floor, well, we don't have the daycare admin, so we had a little more space for some extra programming um, for the taught enrichment, which would stay. So there would be three taught enrichment classrooms on the first floor. Um, then the second and third floor would be dedicated to town hall offices. Um, so I know obviously this was a hypothetical option in some future world, if this is what you decide to do we can talk about where those spaces actually are. If they are on the second and third floor, it's all hypothetical. But we wanted to square footage wise, confirm it was possible in this building. So about half the building's square footage is what you need. Then for the site, um, we had two options. One where we expanded into the back. Um, like I was saying, the back was not very efficiently laid out. Uh, we create this pocket park up in the front of along Union Street, a, pop, a public park. Um, and we restriped the area out front and out back for parking purposes. But then we had this pocket park and then we have an infant toddler playground dedicated and then a preschool playground dedicated in the back um, with, you know, traveling along this southern 
site border. You can come out the, the building here and come down here to each playground. Then the less, it, less expansive option would be just to reconfigure the front where you don't have that pocket park. You utilize this area to section off specific preschool and infant toddler playgrounds, you know, do the same thing where you add greenery along the street um, and restripe for efficiency, um, but not expand into the back. And included in all of these options, like I was saying before, finish upgrades, paint, ceilings, lights, flooring, um, doors, um, the exterior repairs that I talked about, repointing, a lot of the building um, needs to be repointed. Um, sealing, repairing and sealing all the wood features, you know, so that more water infiltration doesn't get in and start or continue rot. Um, and uh, the, that I was talking about the mechanical and electrical, all the upgrades, mechanical needs to be fully replaced. It's electrical um, needs to be resized to handle current needs, current code needs, um, new switch gear, a secondary switch gear, um, and an upgraded fire alarm system. And then the plumbing would need accessible fixtures, um, high efficiency fixtures to reduce your water use. Um, I said earlier, inflate the piping and, new, and a new boiler sump pump um, and a new water heater. Lots of stuff. Um, and accessibility upgrades. In these options, we did a variety of them. Once we got our pricing back, uh, we realized that there's a certain rule that I, I won't go too far down the road is, but when we got our pricing back, we realized that the price of the construction that's needed for this exceeds a limit that will make us have to upgrade the whole facility to, um, to be ADA compliant, um, mass accessibility compliant which means we would have to upgrade the elevator and the shaft because the elevator itself and the shaft don't comply um, currently. And we'd have to do a bunch of other little things, you know, to um, upgrade the accessibility of the building. And then um, in each classroom, we sort of listed out for the estimator the various things that we need to include in the classrooms themselves to become EEC um, licensed. Now the fun part, I'm sure you're already having fun. So the synthesized design um, in the basement, similar to the big option, almost the same actually, is the cafe. You come in from the side door. We've got these movable partitions so that you can open up the cafe to the recreation and teen area. We've got big barn doors. Um, between two teen areas and a stage for them to do karaoke, which is apparently big right now. Um, and basically trying to make the, the area as flexible as possible while also sort of sectioning off a very dedicated fitness area that can then access these locker rooms, um, you know, privately. And then the gymnasium, and I talked about a potential optional addition to this gymnasium for knocking down the current one and, and creating a bigger one. So this is a rendering of that area. So actually I'll go back. You're standing about right here where this door is. So um, the movable partition is open. And so you're looking into the cafe. You can see the cafe and you know, the seating over here. They, have, they already have a ping pong table that we can reuse. And the, the barn doors that I was talking about and the kids doing the karaoke on the um, stage in the other room. And new finishes, like I talked about, LVT, new, new ceilings, new lights, just really freshening up the space um, and making it more of a home, more of a community center. So the first floor, similar, almost exactly to the, to the big option, is reconfiguring the first floor. We put the daycare staff on the left and the, and the youth commission staff on the right because there was more space, they have more um, they have more administrative employees and need more office space. Added a couple accessible restrooms for the public. So right now people have to sort of use either one in the offices, in the Youth Commission offices, 
for the children's sized ones um, outside the community room. So in the community room, we also added another movable partition and swapped the toddler and the infant room down here um, because one made more sense size-wise. And you'll see in each one of these floor plans, the elevator is new and the shaft is new. In the second floor, we decided to keep the classrooms essentially the way that they are. Um, because like I said, they function and we would add things to them, furniture pieces and, and, and cabinets and stuff to make them better classrooms and then utilize that classroom that's not being used as a STEM art room. And knowing that that's really just about finishes in a sink. So if they needed to be converted to a classroom in the future after growth, totally possible. Um, and the girls and boys rooms will be expanded for the required, the code required fixture counts. Um, and accessibility um, and adding, like I had mentioned before, the accessible ramp up to this whole left side is the side that's raised up 21 inches-ish. And the third floor is that cool, cool idea um, to have an, an audience and a stage so that you guys can hold potential community theater or some town business. Um, then keep this room that's already there for historical, but it can also be, you know, multi-purpose and then have an additional hearing room down here. Um, near the elevator, we kind of went back and forth about, you know, which of these rooms could be used. It made more sense for the public. If you were coming up for a hearing, take the accessible route. Um, and we improved and increased the bathrooms um, to sort of fit with the occupancy of this room, the amount of people. Um, and this is a rendering of that stage. Um, we would, part of the finishes would have some acoustic panels along the walls, um, new finishes, but movable chairs so that you can reconfigure it for whatever the, the use may be. Then lastly, the site, just a little bit more rendered um, and a couple of, a couple of improvements from the previous options where it's the same idea, pocket park out front, pocket park out front. Um, the infant toddler playground and the, and the preschool playground, but what we added was um, access from this back parking lot up this southern uh, access to the front entry. Because right now when they park back here, they have to sort of walk up a driveway. There's not really a, a, par a room for a, a sidewalk, um, so we want you know, patrons in the back and staff in the back to be able to access the building safely and, and not have to deal with that. Um, now for the pricing. Um, so we got uh, final pricing on this. So the top line is sort of like the base construction. He does all of the, the construction without any additions to it. And then we have these um, optional additions, like I said before, the gymnasium. And then we were thinking potentially, I'll show back here, having a ramp somewhere around here um, to get you up to, from this park parking lot, accessibly up to this um, entry where I was talking about the cafe, the cafe entry and the gym entry. Um, so we added that as optional additions. Then there's a construction contingency added to that number, um, which is, definitely needed for a building like this when there's a, we know that there are going to be a lot of surprises in an old building where you, when you start to get into it, you're going to find a lot of surprises. Um, then we went down through the soft costs, design team, meaning the architectural and the, the, um, our consultants, mechanical, electrical, landscape, structural, historical. Then FF and E means furniture, fixtures and equipment, meaning, um, exactly what I said, furniture, basically everything. If you, I have a friend who says, if you tip the building upside down, anything that falls out is furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Um, then an owner's project manager will be required for a public project like this. The only thing that is to be determined um, are, are potentially needing to relocate during construction um, and any moving and storage fees along with that. Then on top of that, we put a 10, 
10% project contingency, similar to the construction contingency, but it's sort of like an overall things that come up, you know, especially in the stage where you're in totally conceptual world, um, you want to be safe with contingencies. Um, and that brings us at uh, 23 million about without including those two additions. Then I don't know if Jen wants to chime in here, but um, we talked about some potential funding. Doug, you look like you're going to say something. Yeah, if you, I can do this slide and wrap it up if you don't mind. Is that okay? Yeah. I don't want to step on your toes. No, we, we, we wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about some of the potential funding options because the $23 million number is obviously a, a huge number. Um, and this is by no means exhaustive, but it's kind of some of the, you know, some of the biggest areas we could look toward, you know, the towns in the Community Preservation Act. You know, unfortunately, we haven't really been in it long enough uh, to have enough to be able to fund a project of this size. Um, you are allowed under the CPA to borrow funds against future CPA receipts. So even if you don't have the cash in the bank with the CPA, you can borrow against it and pay the debt service um, with your CPA revenue coming in each, each year. Um, but we, even with that plan over 30 years, we still would not have enough to fund a project this large. I think the maximum um, that we could borrow over 30 years against CPA for a historic preservation project, the maximum would be about $6 million. Um, there's other areas, and, and Jen certainly knows more than me, um, looking at community development block grant, uh, looking at mass development, collaborative workspace programs, and some public-private partnerships. So there are definitely some other innovative programs you know, that could help offset some of the cost, but, but I don't want to sugarcoat it. You know, really, the, the vast majority of a project like this um, in Rockland would have to come from a debt exclusion. Um, so that, you know, after the, the large elementary school project we just uh, funded, taxpayers just funded, and, you know, knowing we have a fire station project also coming down the pike, you know, this is obviously going to be a big decision. And I, I just wanted to kind of wrap up by saying that we obviously do not expect any kinds of decisions tonight. We really just wanted to have the architects uh, present, you know, their thorough analysis and, and what we all collectively felt like, you know, was a um, a good summary of the existing conditions and what some of the options could be and then most importantly what we think a recommended plan could be if this is something that you know the board wanted to um, consider pursuing. My, my personal feeling is that you know we obviously can't make any major decision like this tonight but I, I would recommend that over the course of this fiscal year we have put this on future agendas and have more discussion about it because I, I personally think by the end of this fiscal year, we should have a plan and a decision about which way the board wants to go. Because I, I feel like the status quo is not the best plan. You know, we're gonna continue to have major plumbing breaks and roof leaks and we're gonna continue to sink more funds into this building and it's, and while we're spending money, it's still as a whole gonna continue to, to deteriorate. So I think we should either consider you know, funding, pursuing, you know, taxpayer support to fund a, a great project like something like this, or look at another option, which would be to divest ourselves of this building and relocate, you know, the Youth Commission um, services and look at potentially selling the building in for whether it's senior housing or, you know, another, um, another uh, like a sandpaper building, sort of artist studio. There's all different kinds of options out there. Those kinds of discussions I don't think we should have tonight. I really want to take advantage of the architects that are here and the other team members, all the other staff that are on, on the Zoom call. And, and I'll invite any of them if they have any you know, closing comments as well. But I, I hope you found this helpful tonight. And we'll try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I just want to start by uh, thanking uh, Liz for the presentation and, and the other architects for putting this together. Uh, certainly, uh, Certainly you guys were thorough, uh, a lot of food for thought here, a lot of great uh, amenities and, and drastic improvements to a, uh, a building that uh, Gene and Rich Furlong have, uh, Gene Blaney and Rich Furlong have done uh, yeoman's work in maintaining over the years. Uh, but, you know, to, to Doug's point, it's, it's a building that we as a board need to uh, make a decision whether we invest or divest. So with that, uh, I'll open up to the rest of the board. Uh, for questions to the architects or any of the other people on the call right now. Uh, Ms. Nyman. 
I don't have any questions at this moment, but thank you, Liz, for this thorough presentation. It's really eye-opening. Mr. Ryan? Why are you? He's on mute. It's, it's, um, you know, it's going to be a contentious issue, I think, with the people who want to save it. But, um, you know, so much money to save a building that's so old, when, it, when the cost to transfer the um, people who uh, occupy the building would be far less than the $23 million we're going to spend over the course of 23 years, or however many. I just, uh, it, you know, I'm willing to look at it more, and um, you know, I want to thank the company for doing a great job on the presentation. Uh, it's real easy to read and understand, and um, it answers an awful lot of questions, and we'll discuss them as the days go on. Thank you, Larry. Mr. Mullen? Uh, yeah, yeah, first of all, Liz, I want to thank you uh, like for your efforts, uh, you know, with everyone in the town, uh, like in putting Oh, you know, it was such a thorough, oh, you know, presentation uh, together for us this evening. I think um, it's uh, very sobering, uh, to say the least, um, in terms of, I mean, we knew the building, oh, you know, needed a whole lot of work, but the, uh, you know, to know there's a $23 million price uh, uh, like of doing the work at this point is, um, uh, like, is something really we have uh, like we have to contemplate, um, oh, uh, you know, whether we have the wherewithal to, uh, like, uh, like even approach it, or, oh, uh, you know, like if, oh, uh, you know, like or, uh, like if, uh, like or if we should really think about divesting and, oh, uh, you know, like as, oh, uh, oh, uh, you know, like as Doug mentioned, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, the time has come where we need to make a decision. And we need to come up with a plan because I, oh, like I believe whatever we decide to do with the building, uh, you know, we can still keep the building, uh, hopefully as it is with the structure, with its history intact, oh, uh, you know, and then hopefully whether it, oh, uh, you know, will become senior housing or whether it's a town building, we, oh, uh, you know, however we move forward, we'll, oh, uh, you know. Uh, hopefully someone will um, in some way, shape or form have the resources uh, to, main, uh, yeah, to maintain uh, the integrity of the place. But, um, oh, you know, we're going back to what, oh, you know, what Doug said, um, oh, you know, a few moments ago, I would like to, uh, you know, if, oh, uh, you know, if the rest of the board agrees, really, oh, uh, you know, once we get through the summer, oh, I can know where we are dealing with the are there pandemic issues really before us still? Uh, you know, uh, like if we could really, oh, uh, you know, spend some time uh, like as the board in the fall, oh, uh, you know, really discussing this in more depth. Um, and also, um, as well, how it relates, uh, you know, to our priorities uh, that are shaping out in the master plan, um, as well. Uh, you know, and whether, uh, obviously, I mean, we have a a whole host of priorities as a town. Oh, uh, you know, with oh, uh, you know, we're investing in the schools right now. Uh, like we have a fire station that also, oh, uh, you know, we know, oh, uh, uh, you know, needs a lot of work and upgrades and uh, like and likely a whole new building. And I think we, uh, like as a board and as a town in the fall, really need to have, uh, have a conversation about the, oh, uh, you know, the capacity we have as as a town to be able to do this and how we do it and and it's overwhelming right now to try to uh, you know think about how we approach uh, uh, you know this whole thing because the 20 million uh, 23 million dollars is a lot so those are just my thoughts I don't have any specifics because I'm just trying to digest all of this as well so uh, thank you again Liz thank you Mike uh, Mr. Penny Thanks, Mike. Uh, Liz and the, and the team, thank you very much um, for this presentation and, and the in-depth analysis. I do have a couple of questions. So <clears throat> um, it's a wood frame building, and we know that we've had over years water infiltration uh, going through the, uh, through the bricks. As part of this, did, did 
did you guys actually go into the walls and the framing to see what the overall framing of the building is and what condition that's in? So we did have a structural engineer on site and for, so he did poke his head above ceilings and, and so where he could see, he didn't do any demolition, um, but he does have in our phase one report, he did look through and to see what the structure was and sort of identify potential areas where there was water infiltration um, a lot in the basement mostly and um, all right so all right so that's where you know as i'm looking at it we actually got you know about 15 percent of the overall project set aside for contingencies um you know when i'm looking at at the two at the two contingency funds that you've got you know and certainly from my side that the the concern is and i think you said it when you've got a building that's 100 and whatever it is, 15 years old, um, would frame once you get into it, what are the things that you find? Um, <clears throat> and it's also, you know, we had talked about this earlier. I think we knew that the work that was needed uh, in that building was gonna push us over the threshold that, that then necessitated a, a complete renovation and, and up to AD, uh, ADA compliance. Um, with the building being that old, do we run into issues with the ADA compliance for doorways? And I mean, are we talking about a lot of reframing and, and uh, reconstructing in there to hit to hit the ADA compliance? Um, I would say that a lot of it would have to do in terms of doors. It would have to do with your hardware. Um, and there are some doors that I would say visibly I could see that they were smaller, but I would think that a lot of them they look pretty like they would maintain a three foot door. Um, it's more about getting from floor to floor, getting up those, you know, raised portions, um, having prop proper signage, stuff like that. But hardware will be a big one for doors because you have a lot of knobs, which aren't really. Okay. okay. I, you I would jump in and say just in general, I think in terms of how the cost estimator put the estimate together, um, because it's an old building with a lot of unknowns, because we're going to have to do these upgrades. Um, and, and I think to some extent, because the, the, the construction cost situation is very volatile right now, um, I think when, I think he erred on the side of being conservative in a lot of cases. And I think as, when you do that in every single case, it tends to drive the, the overall cost up, right? So, um, but I think the number is high enough so that we can see that even if it's, you know 10% high, it's still uh, in terms of the order of magnitude, it's still a lot of money. I mean, I think one thing that the, the town can do is sort of monitor um, construction costs for public projects over the next you know six months or a year and see see how that trends. Um, but I think fortunately we'll be able to do that as we start our school project. <laughs> um, but I I don't think you know there there's no there's no sort of magic silver bullet to this. But there are a lot of small things that, you know, if everything went right, this project would not cost $23 million. But I don't think we felt good about coming to you and, you know, telling you, well, it's going to be a lot less because it, it could very well, you know, cost that much to do what, what we're proposing here. No, I appreciate it. And then, and then the last part of this, you know, and I think Mike Mullen touched on it, you know, as we, as we're working through our master plan, this is, you know, for a town our size, it's a building with a lot of square footage, you know. So when we look at this and we have these conversations, it becomes even larger. You know, what, what, what is the plan, right? Because, you know, as you went through these three phases, you know, you're looking at really four floors. Um, so there's a lot of square footage. So as a town, you know, what are the needs? You know, we do have... Um, a town hall that we're outgrowing and, and at this point is, you know, almost 50 years old. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of community space other than what's in the, in the school systems. So there are some good things to it, but at that point is 20 or $23 million worth the price tag of doing that. Um, so yeah, I, I think we've got a lot of, a lot of conversations uh, ahead of us. Thanks, so can, I, can I just jump in for a second, Mike? Sorry. 
Um, yeah, so actually, I, I was going to say anybody, uh, anybody else, now that the board's uh, spoken, uh, Gene, Rich, uh, Alan Cron, if you guys have any comments, uh, feel free to ask. So I just want to say thanks, Studio MLA. They were great to work with. Um, they're very, very creative people. And um, so that was, it was a lot of uh, fun and I learned a lot working with these folks. But I just want to say when the Board of Selectmen move forward to make your decision on what to do with the building, you know, I know you'll consider the programming, um, both ourselves and daycare and, and I'm getting all teary eyed because <laughs> I'm just really tired of talking about the building, but, um, and it's, it's, it's all very, very important. I think, um, sorry guys, it's been a very long day. <laughs> Between COVID and our sprinkler issues, um, both ourselves and the daycare are, are um, feeling like this is our home. I, I want you to consider the cost of relocating us, the cost um, of these programs and, and the possibility of even losing these programs. I think like Rich said, we don't have a lot of square footage in this town. Um, with moving out of um, the building and having the sprinkler system put in last year, um, it was great that it was during the summer, but if it was during the winter, um, we utilize almost three floors of that building. So um, I think you just need to take into consideration that square footage and, and, what, and, and where we could possibly go. Um, I know I've spent and had lots of conversations with folks on where we would go, what we would do. Um, and, and honestly, I just kind of put that to bed because I really don't know. Um, I think we need to wait until the schools are built and, and that project is done. So with that being said, I just want you to consider all of that when you make your decision. Mike, if I could jump in for a moment. Absolutely, Jen. I just, I also want to thank Studio MLA. Uh, Mike and Liz and the whole team were fantastic to work with. So that we really appreciated that on the staff side. Um, but I also, this is just food for thought because it's been mentioned a few times, obviously a $23 million price tag is scary on, on a good day, um, let alone in current times. But when we had mass development look at Union Street and, and develop an action strategy for revitalization of the area, the McKinley School was identified as a key infrastructure, as well as um, an opportunity for redevelopment. And that's a large part of the conversation for the board uh, moving forward around what that redevelopment of McKinley looks like. Um, should the town wish to keep, to maintain the, the building and keep it, um, you know, one of the strengths that was identified in the report was that in fact, 10% of Rockland's population utilize the building for, for, for very fundamental and important um, public programs. Um, and that, you know, it just, it is, it could serve as an anchor to redevelopment of Union Street. And so those are just things to, you know, think about as the discussion moves forward on the town side for the building. Um, again, $23 million is a hefty price tag. There are other projects needed in town um, and going on currently in town. Uh, but it, it is, it is, I think, seen and functions right now as a key, um, as an anchor property. So just a, f just a few things to think about as we move forward. Thank you, Jen. Uh, anybody else, Richard Perlon? Um, Not much to say other than this has been long coming. We've been trying to get this done for a few years. Uh, we knew that it was gonna be a high cost and there was gonna be some tough decisions to make and that's what it's gonna boil down to. But the building definitely needs some upgrades and some, some a lot more TLC that we can give it on the funds that we have. Thank you, Rich. Uh, to my point, uh, Rich and Jean, you guys have been doing a great job maintaining that building. I know you guys spent countless hours up there. Uh, Jean, I, I know you referenced a couple of years ago, I'm sure it's still going on, but responding you know, in the middle of the night uh, to take care of issues and stuff up there. So, you know, any decisions that we make, you know, will, won't be made in haste. And I think as, as a board, uh, it's important for us to continue to look at this over the next coming months and provide direction to the town administrative staff uh, 
as to what direction we'll be going uh, in, in the future. Obviously, $23 million is, is a big price tag, uh, especially at a time where there's so much uh, uncertainty with, with the market and, and with uh, the job market as well. But, uh, but you know, it, it, was a, it was a thorough presentation. Uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, Studio MLA, uh, I, I thought you guys did an excellent job with the presentation. And it's given us a lot to ponder over the next several months. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll have more discussions. So, so Doug, obviously, you know, jot this down as, as, uh, as something to bring up on future agendas, please. Will do. And, and again, I just, I want to thank the firm. And, and as I noted earlier, you know, one of the, one of the best sort of references an architecture firm can get out of a feasibility study is a commitment that if we do at some point move forward with the project, we want to continue working with them. So I just wanted to say that publicly. Excellent. Thanks, Doug. So if there's uh, no further questions or comments, uh, we can move on. Okay. Not seeing any. Uh, moving on. Uh, next on the agenda, other old business not reasonably anticipated. Doug? I don't have any. Okay. Uh, number seven, town administrator's report and correspondence. Mr. Lapp. Oh, you know what? Um, I think we skipped over the town meeting recap. If I can do that. Oh, did I? Okay. I'm sorry. Old business. Uh, town meeting recap. Yep. Yep. And, I, and um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mike, did you want to say something before you left? I just I just wanted to thank you know you and the town for for all of you know all of the participation and and you guys have been really great great partners in this and I think we will sign off if you don't need us for the rest of the agenda. You're all set. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Great. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Um, yeah. So town meeting I, and I know we were we were all there but I just you know wanted to make a couple of brief comments. Uh, I want to thank WRPS you know Dave Cable Murphy and Chris uh, and and uh, you know they did a tremendous job and wiring up the cafeteria and the gym and those overflow spaces that was all very complicated and fortunately we, fortunately we didn't need to use those spaces um, I also want to thank all the all the town employees and others that volunteered as ushers I know uh, Jean Blaney who was on earlier she was one of them and probably others on this call as well um, but that was really key because not only did that help us you know make sure people were socially distanced but it enabled us to see households for people that came together from the same household to sit together, which freed up more space for others so we could accommodate everybody in the main room. Um, the fire department, you know, the health agent, Deli, the whole town clerk's office, everybody did a fantastic job. Most importantly, the voters that showed up. I, I was really pleasantly surprised that every single voter was wearing a mask, which is just tremendous. Um, you know, we weren't sure how, how difficult it was going to be if people weren't compliant, but Everybody was tremendously cooperative, and, uh, and obviously the meeting went by very efficiently and, and everything passed. So I want to thank voters for taking the time to come out uh, in these during this difficult time. My two big, uh, the two biggest I think takeaway homework assignments that I have following up from town meeting is to send all the proposed charter amendments up to the state legislature. Uh, I think the way we crafted this was having each one as a separate article. Um, so that uh, in the event that the state legislature wanted to enact some but not others, they could choose that. Hopefully they'll pass all of them, but I'll send up all of those, all five of those separately uh, to both Senator Keenan and Rep Coast and, and have them file those bills. Uh, and then secondly, as we just talked about with the McKinley School, we're going to get right on issuing uh, invitations for bid to get that third floor done and have the building fully sprinkled. And either way, if we stay in the building, we're going to be in a safer building and we'll have that done. And if we decide you know, at some point to divest ourselves of it, the building will have more value being fully sprinkled. So it's a good investment for the town uh, either way. But again, that, that was my only real recap from town meeting. I just wanted to thank everybody for their efforts. And uh, I was really very impressed for the moderator all the way down to all the voters. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. Uh, okay, next on the agenda, other old business not reasonably anticipated. Nothing, okay. Yeah. Number seven, town administrators report and correspondence. Thank you. So I do have a number of items to talk about tonight. Uh, just first, very generally, I know you've all heard about the governor's uh, phase three reopening. Uh, I've been on a couple of calls hearing a little bit more details about it. Some of the big highlights include, you know, with, with real restrictions, uh, a limited reopening of movie theaters and outdoor performance venues, some museums and cultural historical sites, fitness centers and health clubs, and certain indoor recreational activities in the caveat it with low potential for contact. 
and then professional sports teams. So yeah, we're going to get to see some Red Sox games under uh, with an empty stadium, which I think we're all happy about. Uh, the, the call I was on earlier today with the Lieutenant Governor and officials from all over the state, they really talked about how this phase three that we're in now, we're going to be in this phase for a long time. You know, things have been changing very quickly over these last few weeks and months. But the, this phase that we're in now, there, there may be a few steps, you know, as, as how the governor's office calls it. So maybe some minor tweaks within it. But they basically said until there's real therapeutic options or, or an actual vaccine, this, you know, this phase is essentially where we're going to be um, for quite a while. Um, I also wanted to recognize, uh, I, I sent to all of you a copy of our COVID-19 operation and facilities protocol. So um, Jen really took the lead on putting this together, which I'm very appreciative of. We made sure to get this out uh, to all our staff in our town buildings. And it was especially important to get it out right now. And we did because we had all of our town hall employees that were furloughed coming off of furlough uh, today. Um, some of the library employees are, are coming off a of furlough as well to help set up a curbside pickup. Unfortunately, um, the rest of the library employees aren't off a of furlough yet because the building's still closed and the senior center um, is still closed to the public. Um, but with that, you can see, uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail. If you have any questions, you can certainly ask Jen and she can get into it more, but she covered all the major categories about requiring face coverings and social distancing, hygiene protocols, staffing and operations, uh, employee wellness, cleaning and disinfecting, and, and where employees or anybody from the public can go to to get in more information or questions answered from the town or from the state if they don't think things are being done um, properly. As part of that, you know, getting people off for a low and moving toward reopening, you know, we went through each office literally with a tape measure, um, trying to make sure everybody is gonna be safe, looking at options with staggered shifts, et cetera. And the biggest, um, it was interesting. A couple of things were interesting that we found. One is that, you know, the public really has adapted in, in many ways uh, to the new reality we're in. So for example, you know, the number of people that used to line up in long lines inside town hall to, to pay tax bills, you know, they're still getting their business done with a tax collector, you know, either online or through the, through the mail or through the Dropbox, you know, and I, I think, I don't think we're ever gonna see the same number of people physically coming into the building, queuing up to line up to pay taxes like we did before because people really have you know, migrated toward, toward other means. There's obviously still other, you know, other types of departments where there still is gonna need to be face-to-face um, -face interaction. And, and just logistically within our, within our building, the biggest concern I had from a safety standpoint was with the town clerk's office because their office to begin with was just very, very crowded and cramped under the best of circumstances because there's three people in a small office, but by nature of virtue of the work that they do as the, the keeper of all our town records and the volume of paper and files that they have to keep, there's just no room in there to physically keep them safe and not be bumping into each other. You know, we have plexiglass for the customers, um, but it still wasn't enough. So what we're doing is we're gonna be moving the town clerk individual down a short all downstairs into, it's technically called the employee lounge, call it, call it a break room uh, down in the corner. Um, she's gonna move down there with a whole lot of files. And then her other two staff, um, Liza and Christine, are gonna stay in the clerk's office. That will enable them to properly spread out, have a more appropriate distance. And they're still the first main interface with the public dealing with all the birth certificates, death certificates, all that type of thing. And this is gonna give you know, Donna a little bit, you've seen her before having to be you know, in the back with a, with a screen up trying to get a little bit of quiet to get her work done. This is gonna enable her to be more efficient downstairs, be uh, much more effective with uh, storing our files and, and, and keep both customers and staff in the clerk's office safe. So that's a move we're gonna be making um, very soon. And I think probably the, the thing that most people from the public are interested about, when are we gonna be reopening town hall? Uh, we have a meeting with all of our department heads one week from today, which is Tuesday the 14th, where we're gonna be sorting out uh, a partial reopening to the public. And my plan is to do it uh, with appointments only. So essentially what anybody needs to do is if, and we'll lay out all the details later, but it'll be a plan generally where if somebody needs something, just like they have been all along, because we've been open for business all along, even though our building's been closed, call up the department, talk to them. They might call the building inspector, Tom Rubel is here. Tom might speak to them and they might be able to conduct their business 
electronically, via email, whatever. If it's something where they really need to come in and in person, face to face, show some plans, fill out an application, whatever, Tom will make an appointment for that person, we'll come up, let them in, do their business, and and escort them back out. And we can do that department by department. And uh, I think that'll be a very uh, effective and safe way to to move toward reopening. So there'll be more to come. Uh, we're going to sort out those plans next Tuesday, and I intend on shortly thereafter having that partial reopening with appointments only. I also wanted to highlight that the uh, Chamber of Commerce is going to be having a, a Zoom meeting for all its members um, that I'm going to be participating in on the, on the 16th. Uh, and the topic is COVID-19, reopening town, impact on the town budget, operations, all that. Senator Keenan, Rep. to Coast are going to be there from a state perspective. I think Mike Mullen was also invited uh, as well. I'm sure if any of you would like to be uh, on that Zoom meeting on the 16th, uh, I'm sure the chamber would be uh, welcome, would, would welcome any of you to be on that as well. The, again, the, the targeted audience is local Rockland businesses and understanding reopening in town. Uh, also earlier today, we had a, a, a nice photo op with uh, Plymouth County. Uh, Michael Laughlin was there and Kara was there in addition to, to our town accountant and we received our first set of installments on our CARES Act reimbursements. We received over $52,000. And really, I just wanna thank Biz for all the hard work she's been doing. It's, uh, you know, the county's administering this. So it's different. It's a whole new set of processes, different from all the normal state or federal grants or reimbursements that we're used to. So it's been a tremendous amount of work and, and Biz is all over it. And we're, you know, we're ahead of most other communities. Some communities haven't even gotten any requests in. And we have, uh, not only have we already gotten three checks today, but we have more already uh, in the queue. One major point I want to highlight is, you know, the state's coming out with new requirements for a substantial amount of PPE and technology that the schools are going to have to have in order to open up in the fall. So for the rest of the state, not Plymouth County, where Plymouth County is implementing the CARES Act reimbursement and not Boston, because Boston's doing it, but for the whole rest of the state where the state's doing it, the state is funding those PPE and technology mandates through their CARES Act reimbursement. So this is all new. So we spoke, you know, Mike and Karen and I and Biz spoke to the county about that today saying, you know, they're, they're setting a whole bunch of their CARES Act money aside, you know, for like a future phase. And so we're urging them right now, unlock some of those future phases immediately because our school department's gonna need significant resources to ramp up to be able to open up in the fall. So. We'll be working on that more and you know, Biz and I have a meeting with Dr. Cron and Jane tomorrow morning to talk about that further. That's all on the, on the COVID aspect of things. Um, one random thing I wanted to mention, um, Mike and I met with one of our marijuana dispensaries uh, just recently. They're now called Canavana. They were pre previously called Fidelity. They're over on uh, Weymouth Street. So they're gonna be opening in early August. So this will be the first uh, marijuana dispensary both they're both medical and recreational. Uh, they're gonna open in early August. They're right now in, in detailed discussions with our police department to make sure they have a very effective traffic plan that's gonna be in place so there won't be any negative traffic impacts on abutters. But the, the host community agreement that the town negotiated prior to my coming on board was a really strong one in favor of the town. So it, it, we are guaranteed revenue sharing uh, a minimum of $100,000 a year up to a maximum of $500,000 a year for five years. So there's a good amount of revenue that's gonna start coming into the town and I believe the first installment of that is gonna be a $25,000 check on the first day that they're open for sales. Uh, so that's good news. You know, there's another one over on Commerce Road that's gonna be um, next in line. I think they're still waiting their, their final approvals from the from the state, but I, I was very impressed with Canavana. You know, they, I was there before they did any construction and I was there after and they blew me away. The security, the protocols, they are, I think, um, a very impressive organization. And Mike, I saw you turned your mic off. I didn't know if you wanted to add something to that. Well, no, I wasn't sure if you're going to go to me, but no, I, I, Doug, I couldn't agree more. I, I had never been to a uh, marijuana dispensary and uh, it, it was really, really eye-opening. I was very impressed with the security measures that, that Mario has in place. Uh, you know, just just the, the building itself, it, it, was, it was impeccable. Uh, obviously, it hasn't been open and to the general public, but, you know, every 
everything that he's implemented from, you know, his own security for, for, you know, his products, but also uh, for the safety of the general public during, you know, these COVID times uh, was really, really impressive. And, you know, he's a, he's an impressive individual. And I think he's somebody that I'm, I'm happy to have uh, as a businessman in the town of Rockland. So. Agreed. Um, and then the last two things, uh, the first is I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the FEMA uh, flood maps that we had the zoning bylaw to adopt the new FEMA maps. And then at the last minute, FEMA told all the communities to abandon them. So we passed those over at town meeting. I was on a conference call with a number of other towns uh, and officials from the state and FEMA yesterday. And it was, it was very interesting. Um, I think they were a little you know, defensive about some of the criticism they got for pulling back. Uh, but the long and the short of it was uh, they said there's not an issue with their maps and that the maps are not going to change. That they, they, they said they pulled back because some other communities were not able to uh, adopt them in time and it had to be an all or nothing um, process. So with that, you know, it, it might be possible that our, our planning board may not have to hold additional public hearings um, if that's true, that the maps actually aren't going to change. But we will have to adopt it at a future town meeting once they reinstitute a new six month time frame. That at some point they'll tell us when it has to be done again. And I urge them to align themselves so that the end of that six month period would be in the spring around, you know, May, June, because that's when most towns have their annual town meeting. They wouldn't guarantee that. So hopefully we won't have to have a special for it. Hopefully we'll be able to do that at our next uh, annual town meeting or, or the one after that. Um, and then lastly, uh, Diz and John Ellard and I are preparing for a uh, uh, ratings uh, call with Standard & Poor's for our first large bonding that we're going to be issuing for the school building construction project. And I want to thank Biz and John. They're certainly doing the vast majority of the work in preparing for the call. Our main goal, we have a, a AA stable rating and, and talking to our financial advisor, you know, we're just hoping to keep that rating. That would be successful, you know, given these difficult financial times of dipping into stabilization and spending free cash, et cetera. Um, we've done some practice, you know, dry runs and, and had some, a lot of discussions with our financial advisors. So I think we're very prepared. I think we have a good story to tell about the town and how we're positioned to be a good investment for folks to buy our bonds. And the bottom line is, you know, while this is a horrible time economically for everyone, it's a great time for the town to be bonding a large project because interest rates have never been lower. So this is really a, the only silver lining with this terrible economy that we're in is it's a, a very... Uh, cost-effective time for taxpayers to be, to be uh, issuing bonds for this project. So we'll make sure we get that done. And that's all I had for an update. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. Uh, selectman's comments. Comments and opinions expressed by individual members do not necessarily reflect the views of the Board of Selectmen and are the opinions and comments of only the individual member. Mr. Mullen. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted uh, to um, Alec to mention Alec and congratulate um, Alec, 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 I now retired, I now retired, um, I now retired as sewer superintendent. I'll, 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 well, John Laughlin on Alec, Alec on his retirement. Uh, like in many, many, many cases, uh, John has been the unsung hero um, of everything in Rockland. He literally kept our pipes running and, um, and he did a damn good job at it. Um, he's just, he's a gentleman. He's, uh, he's such a good guy. He worked extremely hard, uh, like in everything he did for the town. Um, and I just really wanted to uh, congratulate him on a job well done. Um, I like and thank him, I like for everything. So that's all I have today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, well said, John's one of the best. Uh, Mr. Penny. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I just want to say thanks to uh, to Doug and Biz and everyone else involved uh, in regards to the school project. Um, you know, uh, when you undertake a project like this in such a small town, uh, we don't have the resources of a larger town, and there are, there are a few people that take, I think, an unfair burden in these projects. Uh, Biz, Doug, and Alan Cron are, are three individuals who are are taking an unfair um, burden uh, upon themselves for such a, a large project. And I just I just want to say thank you to all of them. Um, other thing, it was great uh, seeing baseball back on the field. 
at, uh, at the stadium. Uh, it has been a long time overdue. And while uh, I don't have uh, children playing anymore in the stadium, uh, just seeing the pictures and, and everything, uh, it, it's great to see it. Um, with that, um, just want to say to everybody, stay safe, um, be smart, and um, support the local businesses as we begin to open up. Uh, these businesses have just taken a beat. So uh, if you can, uh, please support our local, our local businesses. Uh, it, uh, it will benefit the town greatly. Thank you, Rich. Well said. Mr. Ryan. Larry? Larry, you're on mute. Larry, you're on mute. Got it. All right. So I want to thank John Laughlin for the work he's done for the town of Rockland. Uh, John and I go way back to the glory days of uh, softball in Rockland back in the 70s uh, when we all played together and it was a big deal. Uh, we remained friends all these years together and uh, uh, some of us uh, rode the, the mountain east, as we say, you know, and took the law and order and bore stars and, and uh, helped the town out. And John Laughlin was is one of the better men to step forward and fill the job at the sewer departments, uh, a troubled spot in my early years. Um, I can't thank him enough. And uh, thank you to David Taylor for stepping up and being the interim sewer commissioner while John has to take his retirement and the sewer commissioners look for a permanent replacement. Uh, we got a good team down there uh, doing good things. Um, they're being watched heavily by all our commissioners and that's a good thing too, but I wanna thank them all. Uh, above and beyond uh, our, our financial team, thank you, thank you. And I wanna thank the town of Rockland for allowing me to serve as chairman and vice chairman over the years. I, I don't really expect to ever go back to being chairman or vice chairman and only because uh, we have the board we have now that uh, is gonna be taken over and the old fuddy duddies like me will be uh, passing by the wayside in, in our day. So I just wanna thank the town for all the things that uh, they've allowed me to do for them. And uh, I expect to work hard for the next couple of years and and uh, go out with a, uh, a, a bang, if you will. That's it. All right, thank you, Larry. Uh, just remember, you know, you still got another couple of years, so this is oh, no swan song for, for Larry Ryan here. Hey, I'll be up before him. I know. <laughs> thank God. Oh yeah. Oh no, no, I'm a, I'm a full part of the boat, but I'm just not going to be in a leadership role as uh, as more of an advisor role, if you will, because uh, the selectmen that are my juniors, which is all he is. Uh, are really getting your stuff together and doing a fine job down. Uh, we got all thought every thing that could, can be covered and needs to be covered covered, and uh, we all uh, uh, helping our town administration to do the best job that they can for the town of Rockland, and we are doing that good job, and we will continue to do it. And uh, town of Rockland, have no fear. The good people are here. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Okay, for the first time, uh, Vice Chairman Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank John Laughlin for his years of service to the town of Rockland. Um, he's been a personal friend and someone I've been proud to work with um, over the past few years. I also want to thank my colleagues on the board for appointing me as Vice Chairman tonight. Um, it is an honor and I have some big shoes to fill from Larry and I'm sure I'll be leaning on him for some great advice as always. So thank you all. Thanks, Kara. Um, yeah, I also, I also want to thank John Laughlin. Uh, John, John's been at it for a, a very long time and uh, his knowledge and expertise is, as well as his professionalism. And I think, you know, Mike said it, you know, uh, it's just a true gentleman uh, and he'll be solely missed uh, and we appreciate him. Uh, I also uh, want to congratulate uh, Rich Furlong on his retirement. Uh, 36 years on the fire department, uh, you know, just, just another great classy individual uh, in the town of Rockland. Fortunately, he's still active and 
all sorts of things, including this meeting tonight and the, uh, the McKinley School Building uh, and the Park Department. So, you know, Richie's not going anywhere, but, you know, congratulations on making it through 36 years uh, on the fire department. Uh, with that being said as well, uh, the Plymouth County Commissioners uh, that came down today, along with Treasurer O'Brien, uh, you know, it was $52,000 today. Uh, we've been granted, I believe, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, upwards of $1.7 million uh, should be coming our way over the next uh, next few weeks, months uh, from the CARES Act. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to do it all, but it'll definitely cover a lot of what we've lost uh, to this point or what we've had to spend uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, another thing too, uh, Doug, happy uh, one-year anniversary. Uh, you started a year ago today. It has been a tumultuous year, to say the least. Uh, without your, uh, without your your leadership and guidance, I, I know for sure that uh, that I, I would not have been accepting this uh, nomination to be chairman tonight. Uh, so, so with that, you know, uh, I appreciate it, Doug. Uh, I know the rest of the members of the board appreciate the work that you do, uh, the the calm calming presence that you bring to town hall uh, and and the team that you've really built up there along you know the team that you brought in or that you know we brought in around you but also the ones that were there before uh able to get you know full buy-in uh from every department which is is very very impressive so uh keep up the great work you know you've got a few more years obviously as well so about year one it's always the toughest idea so um Thank and you then, very much. I just want to say, I hope the honeymoon isn't over, though. Let's keep the honeymoon going. <laughs> well, as long as we got this global pandemic, I think it'll go on for a while. Uh, and, and finally, you know, I, I want to thank the other members of the board. Uh, I said last year, I, I think it's actually uh, on this date or, or you know, a couple of days ago, a year ago, that uh, you guys made me uh, the chairman. And, and at that time, you know, to Rich's point, you know, he made the, the campaign promise that, you know, or suggested that a chairman not be for more than a year at a time. And, and I firmly believe that is something that I think Mike uh, and Larry and I had talked about when we were you know, the three member board. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I struggled with it, you know, when it was first suggested that I do it again. Uh, but, you know, I, I understand with all that's going on right now, uh, it's difficult making a change in that position. And I look forward to another year. Uh, and your continued support. And with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion. Second. Not everybody at once. So, okay. I got a motion and a second. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Mullen. Yes. Mr. Penny. Yes. Mr. Ryan. Yes, and thank you all. And Ms. Nyman. Yes. And myself, meeting is adjourned. Stay safe, Rockham. Good night. Thanks to see you all.